So let's start. So I guess the announcement is again that Crossback One is due on Thursday, five o'clock. If this is a problem, let us know and we can negotiate. Um, but it might be in your interest to just get it done with as well. Right. So we'll re release Coursework 2 next week. And uh, yeah. Uh, right, I should say on that note that if you already told Guillaume your Git repository, if you could please ignore that and tell me your Git repository because of Guillaume being out of action for the time being. Um, Sorry? Uh, yeah, so you could do that or on Mattermost, or I'll, I'll send out a message on my place reminding you as well. But um, Right, and then the way you submit is you commit before the deadline, and I look at last commit before the deadline, so you don't necessarily have to say anything. If you want to tell me you're done, then it might be good for your psyche. But Okay, uh, so let's go over the questions on the one minute papers from last time thanks for asking those questions um so the first question in some order uh was why this particular function worked by just basically giving one case and i think the easiest way to understand it is to just kind of play through the pattern matching again so i don't know if maybe you should do it this time maybe okay do can we Pull up the definition of less than or equals, because that's an important thing here. Uh, yes, you can click on it. Okay, okay I can so click on you it. You can click on it. Let's get it in another window. Uh -huh. Yeah, like that. Right, so right. Uh, this is actually the same definition that's in the standard library, but yeah. they okay. used similar sounding constructor names and and it should be the same. So, um, what happens when you, uh, when I oh, yeah, click the wrong thing, I type P in the, in the hole, and then I do Control T, Control C, but I'm not going to do it yet. I'm going to teach you how to do it. Um, what we've got is we've got some P stands for some value in this type. It could only have been manufactured by one of the constructors of that type. That's what data means. It means the data are made only by these mechanisms, by these constructors. OK, so now what needs to happen, though, is that we play a bit of a detective mystery with the indices, with the two numbers. Um, so it's, uh, we, we ask, like, you know, as a process of elimination, uh, pun intended, uh, which of these constructors could possibly have committed the crime of being P given this type? And the key deductive method we've got available to us is the fact that the constructors of data types are injective and disjoint. Or in other words, zero is not successor. And whenever two successors are equal, uh, the predecessors are equal. So we play our game. We've got n on the left, zero on the right, and we ask, could it have been this constructor? Um, and you should understand that maybe what I'm going to do a bit of renaming. Do you mind? Just call this K instead, just so that we've got all different mm -hmm. variable names. Just to make it clear that these things weren't the same thing. So, okay, when we play this game, we say, well, if it's going to be this constructor, then we better have N on the right. And that could be true, because n can be 0. Uh, but this constructor demands 0 on the left, in which case, bonus, we figured out that k had to be 0 if it was this constructor. So uh, 
So this constructor works in the special case that n and k are both actually uh, bound to be zero. So that's one possible solution. And then we ask, could it have been this constructor? And this constructor wants a successor on the right, and p has a zero on the right. So it could not possibly have been this constructor that made p. And that's why we end up with one case, and it's even more specific than the type we thought of, because this constructor is very specific, this type here is differently specific, and we get the intersection. So, so that's the deduction that's going on, and you can see our goal, it's actually solved that k has to be zero, and that's good news, because we wanted k to be zero. So that, that bit of deduction, detective work, figuring out how the indices could possibly have matched up. That process is called unification, by the way. Has anyone taught you about unification in the past? So unification is the business of saying, for what valuations of these variables can these equations possibly be true? And that's what's going on. The, the, whenever you do case analysis uh, on, a, on a pattern variable in Agda, it does unification and all the indexing information, and it finds out that the solution is actually kind of a bit more specific in some way. And that's how we managed to prove this theorem. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Um, yes, I think it's one of these things where just trying to communicate a bit more of the mental model of what's yeah. going on in the machine, so it isn't just voodoo. Yeah. It, it's basically, it's using kind of three reasoning principles, namely constructors are different. So if you ever see, if you ever need zero successor, that's not possible. It's constructors are injective, which means that if you see successor on both sides of the, of an equation, you can strip it off. You can, um, uh, you can simplify that. And if you ever get equ an equation, which is variable equals thing, then you can solve it by making the variable the thing. You know, if the equation just tells you what the variable is, you substitute and then you're done. So that's how the machine is, is coming to this conclusion. Yep. Okay, so the next one minute paper question was about the relevant type. And you did not miss the lecture introducing it because you were there. We introduced it at the lecture last time. Um, and the main point of introducing it was indeed to, to show you that it's a thing that can be useful. So remember the thing we had here in the lecture was uh, this proof that actually the less than relation of natural numbers is irrelevant, which if you look at the definition of irrelevant means that any two inhabitants of this type are actually equal. Right? So it means that there's no interesting information in which particular inhabitant you give because they're all equal anyway. The yeah. only thing that matters is if you can give one or not, crudely speaking, right? Yeah. So the reason you, things being irrelevant is good news because if you're asked to prove that two th members of a type are equal, if you're given that task and you know that that entire type is irrelevant, then you've already won. If, you, if there are two things of that type, they're, they're equal. Uh, so it's useful information to say we're never going to be bothered about whether these particular kind of proof components, uh, whether there's any information in them that we need to worry about. So, so very rapidly speaking, proofs you hope are irrelevant because you're just interested in if it is true or not, right? Whereas data is usually not irrelevant because you really care which natural number I give you. Right. Yeah. They are not all equal. So, so yeah, you're, the game to be playing is where are the bits? And yeah, so uh, when we say something's irrelevant, we're not saying that it's of no interest to us. It might be an important fact, but we're saying it contains no data. Yeah. Okay, so the next question was in this proof at the very end where we we wanted to show that this big number was smaller than this big number, and we did it by going via the, 
definition that computed, then because we were pushed to a time, we just put underscores here in, in this function. So this function takes two natural numbers, a proof that one is smaller than the other in this computing recursive definition, and produce an inductive proof of the same thing. Right? So here we see that we are actually pattern matching on the first number. So we are definitely caring about what the number is, right? Whereas here, at the use case, we are just putting underscores, which means I can't be bothered to type this myself, you figure it out. And it works in this case because there's only one way to unify again the type of this function, which was n less than m, with the type of the goal, which is this particular n is less than this particular m, right? So the only thing that works here is to fill in this particular number. Why don't you replace the underscores with question marks? So indeed, I can replace the underscores with question Reload. marks. And I then know. I can solve this, Control c Control s and I will fill it in. Right. So putting the underscore just means that that solving is happening at type checking time rather than at editing time, right? Yeah, so underscore means kind of morally the same sort of thing that it means on the left hand side. When you put an underscore in a pattern, you mean I don't care what this is. You know, but don't bother don't bother telling me. On the right hand side, uh, you're saying, I don't want to know what this is. You can figure it out, can't you? And if it can't figure it out, it'll moan. Um, things go yellow. If you yeah. put underscores in places where it's not at all obvious what's going on there. The background goes yellow, which is Agda for um, uh, uh, I, I'm not smart enough to figure out what goes here, but I haven't given up all hope. Um, yes, the thing to remember about yellow is that it, it means sus, pish, us. Whereas if the background goes brown, it's actual shit. Um, yeah. So you can always try to put an underscore, and if it's yellow, then you revert to a question mark and try to fill it in yourself. Right. But, okay. Uh, next question was, Connor, do you have any tips for deciding when to use with to recurse? Uh, it's often a good idea to use with in when you're experimenting, when you're trying to find your way. Um, uh, and uh, you think, well, here's some information I can definitely get my hands on. So if you can see what recursive call you're going to want to do, and that its output is going to tell you something useful or be part of the output of the whole thing, but you can't quite see how to get there yet, then Starting out by putting it in a with might be helpful, especially if you want to do case analysis. So it's the key thing, actually, yeah. is that you do with whenever there's some extra piece of information that you need to get your hands on in order to make a decision about how to proceed. It's not just that you compute something and you plonk it into the answer as a component. It's some crucial decision that you need to inspect. So you need to get it to somewhere you can match on it. And you might still need to be able to match on the other inputs. Uh, it might just be some extra useful information. So that's the idea of, of with is uh, to get your hands on some extra bit of useful information to the left hand side of your program where you're still able to do pattern matching to help you make decisions. Uh, so I guess we didn't look at this, but here's an example, right? Where yeah, we do a, a recursive one. call and depending on if this recursive call says yes or no, we are returning different things here, right? Yeah, so uh, it's a pretty good idea that if we can decide whether n is less than or equal to m, uh, then, you know, if it's a yes to that, then for the successors of, of n and n, 
there is going to be an explanation, but it's not necessarily going to be the same explanation. So we needed to see this yes or no to figure out whether we were going yes or no here. And then we also have to do something with the extra uh, information that we get back from uh, uh, you know, the, the, the proof that comes with the, the decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was some, um, well, there's another trick that WIF does. And we'll get to that one of these days. <laughs> okay, excellent cliffhanger. Um, um, right, so let's get on to the last one with the question, which was the difference between indices and parameters and data definitions. So I brought out the, the example we always bring out again, because yeah. it actually has one parameter and one index, right? Yes. And the idea is that the parameter stays fixed for the whole definition. So you see it's the same A everywhere, right? Yeah. Whereas the index changes. So here the index is zero. Here it's suck of n for, for some n that we are quantifying over here. Right? Yeah. So if you were, uh, if you wanted to, you could make this, and this A a module parameter. Uh, you know, just say, oh, there's some, the element type, we're going to talk about vectors for a while. The element type is just something that, that stays, that it doesn't matter what it is, and it's uniform for the whole construction, whereas this length really is changing. So also, if you wanted to, you could, in theory, define vectors of natural numbers, and then you could define vectors of booleans and vectors of functions from booleans to booleans and so on, just instantiating this A with different things and have a whole bunch of definitions, right? And, and that would be fine, but here we're saying, well, we can actually just bring out this common parameter and, and define them all at once. Right, yes. So that's, we, we use the word parameter when the variable is deployed completely uniformly, whereas this, the number here is changing throughout the recursive structure of the data. So that's, that's the main difference. Um, I put in, in the completed version, I put what you could do if you wanted to, to make this. If you change this from a parameter to an index, then you could do some weird things. Right? But often it's pretty, often we use the parameters for, for things that yeah. are just fixed throughout. Okay, but let's move on to today's content, um, which is to just introduce a small little toy programming language and, and play around with this and doing this inside of Agda. Um, I'm not sure if you did something like this in Haskell last year, like a small language of expressions. Um, no? OK. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with this. This, and is, this is Hutton, as in Graham Hutton, uh, native of this city, uh, now a professor at Nottingham, uh, uh, wrote it, one of the uh, one of the best Haskell textbooks. And it relates so, to uh, how he thinks about features in programming languages. It says, um, add, you know, start with numbers and adding up, and then add the minimal amount of, uh, of extra stuff to get at the features you're interested in. And we are interested in conditionals if then else. So, uh, yeah, and we're going to bypass all of the, the nitty gritty bits of parsing and tokenizing and all this, right? And just yes. represent our expressions as basically abstract syntax trees. So elements of this data type of expressions, right? So we're yeah. saying an expression is either a number, in which case you, you give a concrete number, or it's a bit, in which case you give a concrete Boolean, or it's the addition of two expressions, or it's an if then else where you have a condition, a then branch, and an else branch, right? Yeah, so no one expects anyone to look at this programming language and go, wow, what an amazing programming language. The point is that it's being kept very simple in order to understand the issues. So the idea is that the numbers here just stand for a computation that has got all the way to a value, and the addition stands for something that still has some work to do to get to a value. Okay, so we can give some examples. So for example, an expression could be number two 
class number three. Okay, that's an expression. Another example could be the number five. You got something going on there with uh -huh. your right, and we can check that indeed we did example one and claim that that is equal to example one prime. Then we see that this is not true, right? Because this expression here is an addition of two things, and this expression is not an addition of two things. So we're really looking at the syntax of yeah. these things, right? Give me a second if you want to do something like this instead. Uh, no, you we can't. Don't. We uh, don't have not in scope. Okay. Uh, so it's not the case that they are the same. Right. Um, right. We could also have another expression. Example two, which is the bit. Oh. Yeah, what's the equal sign there? Yeah. Okay. So I'm adding true and seven. That's an expression according to to the rules of the game, right? Which saying that if I have two expressions, then I get a new expression. Um, so this doesn't make much sense, but it's still part of the syntax, right? So it might be interesting later to see if we can rule this out or, or what if we can make sense of it. Right. And finally, you could imagine the expression, which is if bit false, then example two, else maybe 14, something like this. Right. So I'm using an if and else. This is an expression, this is an expression, this is an expression. So the whole thing is an expression. Um, and you might and might not think that this should be an okay thing to do, right? Because it contains a subterm, which is not okay. But on the other hand, if I'm trying to run this, then I'm saying if false anyway. So expect to maybe only run this branch of the program, right? But it's, it's up to me when I design the running of these programs to see what I want to do with these things, right? Um, right, so maybe Connor, you want to just decide what sure. to do with these things. Sure. Huh. Okay. Well, um, so Fred has given me an exciting adding up thing to do. Oh, we've got values, yes. So those are the things that we've, uh, our expressions, you can see, where did we put them? Here. Uh, we've got numerical values, we've got Boolean values, and we would expect that you know, adding uh, uh, eats and produces numbers. And uh, if once an actual Boolean for the condition, uh, and it's a bit more flexible about what the then branch and the else branch can be, but if is certainly not going to invent a whole new type of values that we didn't have in the first place. So it's um, clear that the values we are hoping for are um, either numbers or bits. So we make this type, which is just numbers or bits. And you notice know, so we've overloaded the constructors. You don't need to pay attention to that. Um, and then uh, we're um, we're going to sort of build. Uh, so, that, I mean, how do you interpret uh, an expression language? You make actual functions that compute with actual values that kind of fit the same pattern as all your different expression forms. So, in order to implement plus expressions, we need to figure out how to add values. But there's a handy, helpful hint, and we've already kind of seen that, uh, you know, there's a snag, um, which is uh, that, not, that some things don't make sense. So one way of dealing with that snag, an honest way of dealing with that snag, is to say, when we add values, 
if we're lucky, we'll get a value, but it might not work. We might not be lucky. So, let's do it. I think I probably want uh, to get my two values as inputs. Right, so, uh, what do I do here? I've got to, I'm hoping to get some numbers. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I just better look and see what turns up, right? There's nothing, to, nothing we can do other than look at both of these uh, X and Y. Well, I could, I could be a criminal if X was zero. I could just return y, whatever it is. And that would kind of move the error along if there was an error. But I think I want to catch the error at the earliest possible moment. So I'm going to look at both of these things. And it chooses some really annoying names. So I'm going to call that one y. And then if we get two numbers in, we're good. This is the happy path. Is it called just? Yes, it is. And uh, I want to. What's adding of numbers? Just. That's ridiculous. It should be adding of types. Oh, but then uh, I just oh. say it's a number. Yeah. The number made by actually adding stuff. Um. What's that yellow doing? There's no yellow there. Okay. Uh, and this is one situation where I think I don't want to fill in three cases. I think I want to catch all. So I'm going to say thank Agda for doing some pattern matching. And then just go vague. And then I say nothing. There. Uh, so we've got add. We've got something that adds uh, values uh, if we're lucky. Um, and now, are we going to go for the whole thing? I think so. Let's see what happens. We've got an expression, and because we know some expressions are daft, again we're in the situation where we might get maybe a value. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so let's see, uh, there are some easy cases, I'll do, do a bit of Fortran, sorry, too, too young for Fortran, uh, Fort, in Fortran, a language of the 1950s, uh, the compiler told the types of variables apart by looking at their names. So it was like, if it began with, if it was called n, it had to be a number, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it was a bit scary. Um, right, okay. So if we've got num n, that's already a value, pretty much. So we can say we've won, I give it back, num n. And if it's a bit, then I can give back a bit. Um, okay, I've got two expressions. I can certainly evaluate them recursively. Um, so if I say eval e, Eval E will give me not a vowel, but a maybe vowel, right? I kind of want to use this, this plus V operation to get my maybe vowel out. But plus V wants values, and I'm only getting maybe values. So I'm going to have to remember how to program in Haskell. Indeed. Can I just do it? You can just do it. I'll just do it. 
By do. Ah, but you want to, right? You want to I... put the do outside of the gold. Ah. Because there's some desugaring going on, and it's not really an expression. Right. I can use do notation. Am I allowed to do this? Or do I have to do it all outside? <laughs> Better if you do something outside. Okay. So in Haskell, I would write get v from e. Eval of e. Um, eval of e. You can see I've actually got a v for value. Uh, and the decoding of do notation has done all the error handling. So we're just exploring the happy path where it actually works and all the management of what if it goes wrong is, is behind the curtains. Oop. And then we do V prime comes from eval of E prime. Um, um, so now we've got both values, and now we can do v with our value adder. Oh, but then I have to say, um, well, yeah, that's the the right thing has happened. So that's the that's that case. And uh, so maybe should we stop at that case a little bit? Maybe so. I think we, there's yeah there's two ways to understand what's going on here. Um, it's kind of the intuitive way and the, the real way. Yeah. <laughs> and I would recommend the intuitive way. But uh, so what's going on behind the scenes is that this do keyword and then these bindings like in Haskell, they get translated to the bind of the maybe monad. So if we look at maybe, let me see how it's Look at data, maybe. Yeah. We see that somewhere in here, there is a that special thing, thing which I'll just part too small. There is something that has exactly this name, and that's all Agda cares about. It has exactly this name, and it targets a maybe in the end. So whenever you use a do, and you have something with this name in scope, then the do will get desugared to uses of this bind operation. Just purely syntactically. No, no check if it type checks or anything like this. Just syntactically. Do means use bind, right? Um, yeah. But this is the thing which is packing up the error handling logic that yeah. says, if it's gone wrong, it's gone, you know, already it's gone wrong. If we're still going after the first thing we're trying to do, then, you know, carry on with the, the value. And that's the logic we need. We could also use with and actually explicitly pattern match on the answer that comes back. But, you know, that's um, that's keeping a dog and barking yourself. Yeah. Um, but I think the intuitive thing to do is to think of this as really executing line by line, right? And if, if it works, it returns just, then we continue. And as soon as it returns a nothing, then the whole thing is returning a nothing. So that's the yeah. kind of mental model I have in my head when I think of these do blocks for a maybe monad, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, some exciting and subtle issues show up in the next case. Yes. Um, uh, well, okay. We've got an if, uh, an if then else. Okay, and there's something terribly uh, important about if then else, which is that it decides between computations, not between values. Um, uh, what do I mean? It decides between what to compute in the first place rather than deciding between whether it likes the outcomes of those computations. So, for example, if you're giving a semantics to uh, if negotiations are successful, then sign a peace treaty, else launch the missiles. You do not want to 
see if the negotiations are successful and sign the peace treaty and launch the missiles and then decide where, which of the two peace treaty launch of missiles you like the outcome of by seeing whether the negotiation was successful, right? If the negotiation are successful, you don't want to launch the missiles, right? <laughs> so so uh, that's the point, is that we want to run at most one of these two branches according to which one gets chosen by that thing. So let's get our hands on the value of EB first. And there's some added spice, of course, because EB might turn out to be a number. So, OK, how'd you get your hands on it? This is a case where I would use WIS. Right, and then this is how you set up a WIS. The dot, dot, dot here literally means I'm too lazy to type all this shit. You could type all that shit if you wanted or copy it and paste it. It's same as line above, but with an extra column for the result of the intermediate computation. That's the idea. I mean, they're all sometimes too lazy, but it's good to try to do it because if you have nested widths, then it doesn't quite work with a dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Sure. Well, what happened is that when I, as soon as I pattern match on VB, Agda will fill it in for me. So my laziness will have been locally justified. Uh, so I look at VB, and well, indeed, there's a bunch of possibilities. It's conceivable that just computing EB doesn't even work, so we could get nothing from it. Uh, let's worry about the sad path later and just explore the happy path. We've got a value. Look at the value. Sometimes it's even a bit. I'm going to do, just delete that line, move it up the way. So the happy path is at the top. OK. And now I know I've got a bit. I can even look at the bit to decide what to do. Hooray, we know what we're up to. Let's evaluate EF. Uh, if uh, the, we got false back. And evaluate ET if we get true back. And it hasn't done the dot 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 no. expansion. Something's something cunning has happened. Right, and then again it's the usual deal. All the other cases, all the unhappy cases, we're giving back nothing. So I'll just squish them into a single catch all. I mean, I could have done it with a do, but I'd rather do it with a width. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, uh, that's our situation where um, we've, told, we've told the best truth we think we can here. That, you know, if you run an expression and you're lucky, you'll get a value. We know we can't promise. Uh, that you'll always get a value because we've got some rubbish expressions. Uh, so, uh, so we're basically, we're telling a weaker truth. We're saying sometimes you get a value. We're not making any promises, right? So I could write a really bad evaluator that it's just sort of, it's got a hangover and it just says nothing, no matter what expression you give it, uh, the grumpy evaluator. So it's quite weak promise. So, you know, sometimes you get value, <laughs> you know, if you're lucky. Uh, so, yeah, this, uh, uh, and we're kind of doing our best. And we can see that this one, for example, if we feed it Fred's example, let's feed it, yeah, let's sure. feed it Fred's example. I think it was, there's example three you want to look at, right? Yes, right. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. So this is going to... Maybe, maybe value. value. Okay, so example three was if false, then launch the missiles, else 14, right? Um, okay, and that's too far. 
right? So type checks is maybe a value. <laughs> we can actually evaluate it. Control C, Control N, TX3. And we see that we did get just 14, right? So it didn't go into the, the true branch and, and launch the missiles, whereas we tried to do the same for TX2. And we do get nothing, right? And I guess if we want, we could do it this way. If we wanted to record this fact, we could set up a little unit case, which is that this is nothing. And similarly here. So if I'm too lazy to type this, then I can say raffle proves that this equals that, and then I can solve it. But that's a bit dangerous if you're actually setting up a test case, right? Because it's saying what the right answer should be based on, on the wrong program, possibly. But, um, okay. okay, I wonder, maybe we just stop here for now, rather than Oof. rush through the next bit. Uh, I think we should give a flavor of it, right, uh, or, or, you know, queue up, you know. Um, in the next episode, we will adopt the only reliable strategy for not getting garbage out. So, how could this possibly go wrong? Right. Well, it could go wrong because we are trying to add numbers and bits, or we're trying to check if seven is true or not, right, in the if then else. So if only we could have a little bit more control over the expressions, what the types actually are, then maybe we can avoid the possibility of failure, just evaluate things to values all the time. Right? And that's the idea of moving to typed expressions. But I think that's that's worth doing in, in enough time, so we yeah. can do that next time, rather than trying to rush through it. Yeah. And what's, then... What's the... Right, so uh, let's look at the holes just by way of creating right. anticipation. And in, even the, um, well, uh, so yeah, we actually introduce a type of the types in our little language with capital N num and capital B bit. That, those are the type of numbers and the types of bits. And then, wow, we're going to introduce typed expressions where the agda type of expressions tells you uh, the toy language type of the expression you're writing. So in particular, the num constructor makes numbers and the bit constructor makes bits and add, adds numbers. And if then else, definitely wants a bit. And it's not fussy about the type of the else then branch and the type of the else branch, as long as they're both the same is the type of the whole thing. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this may well be uh, more effective. Uh, and then if we look at the whole, now we get to say, actually, if you tell me what toy language type we've got, we're working with, I can tell you a much tighter Agda type that represents its values. Our existing value type says, well, it might be a number, might be a bit, I don't know. But if we know whether it's supposed to be a number or a bit, then uh, we can do a hell of a lot better than I don't know. And then we get to say, typed evaluation reduces typed expressions to typed values. No, maybe. Okay, so that's that's the, the <laughs> that's teaser. the prospectus. Yeah. But um, um, eventually we can have even more fun. But let's just tease about one thing at a time. Yeah.
So um, yes, um, it's a classic case of uh, being able to tell a more interesting truth by just having a little bit more language to be precise about what we care about. Okay, let's stop here.